welcome to Pottery Revisited, episode 34. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are discussing chapter 16 of Chamber of Secrets, The Chamber of Secrets. What a title. Or as we like to call it, Lockhart only sees what's in the mirror. I'm just wondering how many, how many times in the Harry Potter series that the actual book title is also a chapter title. I mean, you gotta think Half-Blood Prince should be. Definitely Half-Blood Prince, definitely Order of the Phoenix. Definitely called it a fire. I don't think Prisoner of Azkaban was ever a chapter title. No, I don't think so either. Um, and then there was... And I don't know if Philosopher's Stone was a chapter title either. I don't know. Too much to think about in my little brain of brains. Well, speaking of lots to think about, the students in this chapter are told that they still need to write their exams. As if everything's fine. It kind of reminds me of when uh, COVID happened and all the students were just expected to kind of like, you know, do school and all the normal things they do when the world was in chaos. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And it's particularly unfair to all the students who are petrified because they're waking them up right before exams. They've missed half the semester, half the year, months. They don't have time. They might have like brain trauma, but on top of that, they've missed all those classes. They have three days or whatever. No, mm, it's unfair. I think it's especially rough for Colin because he's he was the first one attacked. And I think that was like November. So he's missed like the entire year and it's his first he year. He has no idea. So he's like, what has he learned? Like one spell, maybe? I also think it's sad that like the threat of exams, like impending examinations is so terrifying that it completely makes all the students forget about murder. Yeah. They're like, hold on, murder. We need to prioritize the true threat examination. I think it's kind of crazy because everyone's so off their kilter because of what's going on. And things have just been getting worse and worse as the school year goes on. Where the fact that they like, there's students attacks. They don't know who it is. Also, Dumbledore's left. Like, everything's in such disarray. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, so you had to sit your exams. And it's just like, doesn't make sense. I feel like the fear of examinations overpowering the fear of murder is just proving Hermione was right that being expelled is in fact worse <laughs> than dying. Oh no. Yeah, I do agree with you, but the fact that like what would happen with the students that were petrified, like would they make exempt- exemptions for them? Because I feel like it's a lot of Everybody's traumatized, but them specifically deserve. Like, they, like they've missed so much instruction that I don't know how you how you could write an exam, like based on just like a few months of school that you like did. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. There should be like summer school classes or something they can attend to catch up. Especially if like you're in the early years. Yeah, I do wonder how Colin catches up in like the when he goes back to school next year because he missed basically an entire year. So I mean, to be fair, Harry didn't really learn anything in his first year, <laughs> spell wise. So it's also a good thing that um, exams do end up getting canceled at the end of the year because Ron talks about writing, uh, doing his exams with the wand, and would he have failed his exams, like his practical exams at least? You gotta think, like in my mind. Like, you know how if you have a math exam and you're allowed to use your scientific calculators, the teachers might have an extra one at the front of the room. You got to think the teacher, like, even though wands are particular to their wizard, you'd think they'd have one or two spare wands in a wood that's not particularly loyal to its owner or anything like that. Like an easygoing wand wood that they can, like, okay, use this one because yours is literally an automatic fail and that's not entirely your fault. Like, Hermione could fail in an exam with Ron's wand, you know? Yeah, I just feel it's a, it's a liability at this point. Like, I just feel like he can't use it in, in an exam room because it's, like, a liability. It could hurt someone. I would hope. But it's Hogwarts, so probably not. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I feel like, ideally, he could just borrow someone's wand and hopefully it, like, kind of works. But, yeah, it's kind of, like he... I feel like the school should have school wands sort of like it has school brooms for Quidditch. Like I know it's hugely different because wands are so personal, but I feel like it is something they should have or at bare minimum, the school should have like a, a fund or like a discretionary fund to like help students who have like financial struggles so that they have the bare essentials. Like maybe you can't afford the new version of the textbook, but you can buy a secondhand version from the school fund. Like if you don't have a wand that works, the school should be able to help you with that. Yeah, I do because... think it's kind of weird that like Ron was allowed to have this broken wand and use it through the whole school year. Like everyone's aware that his wand's broken, but no one really helps him out with anything. <laughs> They're like, wow, sure sucks to be you, Weasley. 
it's kind of the situation where, like, if Ron were smart going into exams, he would ask Percy if he could borrow his wand just for the exam. Because Percy, A, would say yes, because it's school-related and, like, makes sense and is actually a smart choice. And B, Fred or George would automatically give him a trick wand and it would just turn into a rubber duck or something. But it feels like that's something that Dumbledore should give Ron his wand. Give Ron the Elder Wand just for exams. He deserves that bonus. He needs the it. Elder Wand. <laughs> that's, that's my new choice. I think the only solution is letting Ron do exams with the Elder Wand. So the students are told about exams, but in some good news there, McGonagall has an announcement. And, you know, what this whole part of the book, like, students have been attacked, Dumbledore's gone, the students, the school's in lockdown, but Wood... It's just like, you know what? Quidditch is back. That's what he thinks the announcement is. I mean, I guess everyone is, yeah, everyone is super stressed out and depressed. And I think they all want the good news to be the good news that would make them personally the most happy. So I feel like in moments like that, everyone is innately thinking selfishly. It's just Woods saying it out loud. And he's like, never mind all those people that are in danger. Let's talk about Quidditch. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I see, see these Oliver Wood memes and I'm just like, it's such like an exaggeration of his character, but it's really not. It's not. Then it's not, no. Like uh, the, the memes of Oliver Wood's son at the train station for his first year at Hogwarts. Listen to me, snitch keeper quaffler Wood. I named you after a bunch of Quidditch stuff and if you don't make that <laughs> team, I'm disowning you. Yeah, pretty much. But I just like how someone thinks that the heiress of has been caught, someone thinks Tumblr's coming back, but Wood is like... Quidditch is back on. <laughs> Hermione would be like, extra exams. <laughs> I uh, It's funny because like, it's easy to turn Wood into like a stereotype. Oliver Wood is a stereotype of like a sport boy. But having worked in sports and knowing a lot of sports people, sport boys, sport girls, all the sports fans, there are a lot more people in the world that we actually don't realize are actually so into their sport. And also so often use it as like their coping method to not focus on like the horrors of the world that like a lot of people do lean into their their sport, their hobby a lot during trying times. So like as much as Wood is obsessed with it, it's also his coping mechanism for trying times. And they took that away from him during the trying times. Yeah, I do think, do think we saw that during COVID too. Like a lot of people that had like kind of sports or just like exercise or certain hobbies that you needed to be like out and, and like doing stuff for especially the ones that were social, they, I think that really impacted them because we saw like how people were really like pushing for gyms to be open because a lot of people that like really rely on fitness and that's kind of like their hobby. It was hard for extrovert act to comfort is some sort of extroverted activity or interactive thing. And I think Wood is a really good sort of example of that. How like, it's not that he doesn't care about all the people that are petrified. It's just that like on top of all these things he can't control, he can't cope. They've removed his favorite distraction and coping method. Sometimes it's okay to focus on something that makes you happy in trying times because if you just focus on the harsh realities, you'll fall apart. Yeah. This has been COVID advice from Jay. So Jenny comes up to Harry and Ron. She's very nervous and Harry kind of sees her thinking, it reminds him of Dobby because she's so fidgety and she wants to tell him something and they're just like, whatever, tell us, tell us. And they kind of start to realize... It could have been worse. I think if I was Harry in this situation, I'd be like, oh God, she's going to sing me another love poem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry actually describes that she won't actually look at him like in the eye or anything. Like she's more, she's kind of like focusing on like her hands and like looking down. She's not making eye contact. Like she's very nervous. And Ron, of course, is like, yeah, whatever. It's a sister. But like once they kind of think that it's it starts to be something more serious, they're like, tell us, tell us, tell us. And of course, at that moment, Percy comes in and ruins everything. Classic <laughs> Percy, ruiner of everything. <laughs> I think the fact that Harry specifically compares Ginny's look and like body language in that moment to Dobby when Dobby almost says something he's not allowed to say is interesting because that means it's not just like she's struggling to come to terms with something it it almost makes me think that there's some type of curse involved on Riddle's diary that also sort of prohibits her from being able to talk about it because like it's not just her being uncomfortable or unsure what's happening like the very specific correlation to Dobby who has that sort of as a house elf that's interesting it's it's part of like the house elves burden or whatever so to me like it seems like that could be the second level sort of to that comparison is it's not just she's stressed it's that she like has to overcome an actual like physical magical entity or something in order to break that rule 
I think it's also, she's also kind of vulnerable because she's given so much of herself to that diary. And so she's already very anxious because I think that at this point she's kind of realizing like what she has done, like under the influence of Tom Riddle, but she doesn't really know how to explain that. And it could be also that like it, it's it's because she gave so much of her soul away that like it's like made her weak. So she's like she doesn't she can't like make a coherent sentence at this point. And so Percy comes in and it's really funny that um, when they say like Jenny was going to tell us something important and he kind of chokes and he's just thinking that Jenny's obviously Jenny's just going to tell them about him making out with his girlfriend, his secret girlfriend. Do we know that's what happened like we know it well the way that he describes it is the fact that um i think jenny says at the end of the book too that that jenny walked in on him doing something is what he tells to harry and ron and so i'm assuming that he she walked in on them kissing or something and then he didn't want people i always because the way he makes it sound it's like he was the only one there so in my mind she walked in on him wanking that's always what i thought it was the way he describes it it does it does seem like that but at the end of the book i do think that jenny tells them all that percy has a girlfriend and she walked in on them kissing and he didn't want anyone to know because i guess i don't know he knew his family would tease him but the way yeah the way he he makes it a huge deal and like (laughs) it becomes much shadier it's kind of why he's a red herring in this entire (laughs) book sort of like Another thing, oh, by the way, Ginny's about to reveal something important and Percy's like, no, 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 shh, it's fine. Nothing to worry about. Real casual, like. I also um, think it's pretty selfish of Percy to assume that Ginny's important thing to say must be about him. Like, I feel like everyone a little bit suffers from main character syndrome in their own lives, you know? So he's like, the most scandalous thing that's going on in my life is that Ginny saw me kiss somebody. So now that's got to be the most scandalous thing anyone could hear or anyone would have to share. So that's the only thing she could possibly be talking about. It's such a jump. I think also Percy just doesn't really think Ginny, it could be anything but the Chamber of Secrets because to him, it's like Ginny's a first year. She's just like very shy, very nervous. And he just kind of has like his like, kind of self-important syndrome where he just got a prefect duty he is just like if she knew something he would have known yeah so we know that he was trying to like find the culprit and like you know save the day and stuff to make himself look good so very much percy kind of like overlooking things important yeah it's not really his uh he's not the detective no (laughs) that's obviously ron who comes in so strong this chapter definitely i'll talk about that a bit later but um harry and ron are able to escape um the clutches of lockhart by you know appeasing him and his stupid thoughts you're just so (laughs) smart and handsome and why would you spend your time doing anything other than what you want to be doing Go curl your hair, sir. Their idea is to go to the bathroom to talk to Money Myrtle and kind of find out more about the Chamber's secrets, but they are caught by McGonagall. And Harry ends up telling her this story about like how they just want to see Hermione and they want to talk to her and reassure her. And it's been so hard because they haven't been able to see her. And McGonagall's basically moved to tears and she lets them go. And those bastards, those bastards were lying to her. How could they do this to I her? Mean, to be fair, I think deep down inside, like Harry's still main main issue focused. Yeah. But I think Ron is pretty beat up about Hermione. And I think like Ron probably was crying too. We just don't hear about it. <laughs> like he, he you know, they feel it deep down inside. It just... It's like an honest lie. It's like a Freudian slip of a lie. They're like, I'm going to tell a lie that's not the truth, but also it's actually the underlying truth, you know? Yeah, but they get to go in to see Hermione, and Harry finds out that Hermione is holding something in her hand, which turns out to be a page torn from a library book. And rereading this, I'm like, is this in character for Hermione to rip out, like, a piece of paper from a book? A library book, no less? Yeah, I feel like there are two options. Either one is Hermione should have, like, taken a piece of parchment and like written the notes down out of the textbook and then brought that with her or maybe it was such an urgency to her like she read it and was like this is the answer people could die in the next three minutes if i write it down so she just ripped it and ran like i could see like in the heat of the moment like this is life or death someone can fix a book it's magic it's interesting because hermione is not a very impulsive gryffindor compared to the rest of them oh for sure But, like, this is a pretty impulsive move for her. Yeah, but also if you think about, like, if you wait out the, like, the risks of, like, ripping a library book versus someone dying in the next five minutes or getting petrified, like, it's impulsive, but the weight is so off balance in the action that, like, it's almost, like, it makes sense to me, even as someone who loves books, you know? Yeah, she is putting the greater good of, you know, the school ahead of, like, you know, her love of books and, like... 
treating them well. Yeah. So Harry and Ron are able to kind of put the pieces together with Hermione's notes very quickly. And yeah, honestly, I was so impressed because Harry is not, he's not really a quick connection guy, but he really, as soon as he makes that realization, everything sort of falls into place so quickly for him. And he, he jumps to sort of all the right conclusions so fast. Oh, it's a snake. That's why I hear it. And he immediately can connect how some sort of reflection of the creature was involved in everyone's petrification and that's why they're not dead like so fast and I really think that's great and I love it and it's wonderful it's a bit of a roller coaster if you the first time you read it you're like wait how what did we know that yeah I do think it's really interesting that it's also Harry and Ron kind of piecing it together because in the previous book a lot of the time it was Hermione that was piecing things together and Harry could Harry could see the coincidence and stuff, but he wasn't like doing this where like he's just connecting all the threads together. Yeah, the higher level thinking usually falls to Hermione, so it's nice to see them carrying that on their own a little bit. I also think it's a little weird that like no one else thought to look in Hermione's hand. Like her, like in the movie, her hands held out. Maybe it wasn't as obvious as it is in the movie, like the posture of her hand. Yeah, Harry describes it as like her fist is like really tight. So I I think it's just because he just happened to be staring at it for so long. But it just kind of seems like the doctors and the medical staff and Madame Pomfrey and the teachers should have, like, done a bit of a thorough look, you know, because, like, she might have evidence on her. Like, there's a creature that did it. Maybe she has fur on her robes. Maybe she, like, in my mind, as, like, a true crime fan, not a fan of crime, but I enjoy learning about crime, um... Like, often if someone has been attacked, they'll have DNA, like, under their fingernails or, like, they'll grab a bit of someone's hair. So in my mind, you want to know what's in her fist because either she tried to punch the thing or she grabbed something. So to me, like, it seems weird that none of the, like, adults or professionals thought to look thoroughly enough to see a piece of paper. Maybe they related it to Colin because they didn't really see it. But, like, you know, they thought, like, oh, Colin had his camera. Did he take a picture? And it didn't really work out. So I feel like they're just trying to keep the students safe. I guess, but it just seems like a little bit of an investigation of the actual evidence in front of them should have been done. Like, that's the whole no one seeing that piece of paper until Harry and Ron get in there seems like another example of, like, the adults absolutely dropping the ball. Well, that's not unusual. <laughs> like, it's like they don't know anything about how to solve crimes, and it's offensive to me. Also, Dumbledore also left very close to when Hermione was attacked, so maybe it's kind of like, maybe if Dumbledore was there, they would have done more but because Dumbledore was gone they kind of just kind of locked everyone in the hospital wing and threw away the key <laughs> and especially Madame Pomfrey who I think is one of the smarter people in the entire series I feel like she's the one who has to be locked in there with all those patients I feel like she'd get bored and she'd go around and snoop I mean she has a lot going on she has a lot of students have been petrified I don't know it's not that many plus once they're petrified what you know like rinse their foreheads with cool cloths and put their diapers on. Well, I'm I guess. sure they have to get like nutrients somehow. I mean, they're frozen in time. Yeah, but still, I feel like she'd have time to do a bit of sleuthing, and I think she would, <laughs> within reason, be like, "Gee, she has paper in her hands." Well, this next part, Harry and Ron, after kind of connecting all the clues to where the chamber is and what the monster is, they're like, "This is really good information. We should we should talk to the professors." And this is their first time ever being smart and deciding to go to a professor before acting first and it backfires on them <laughs> of course what i do think is interesting is they they make all those connections this is how everyone got petrified they read hermione's notes they're like okay that's what it is and they're like let's go running through the hallways willy-nilly i'm like i don't know get like a a bedpan or something shiny from in the hospital room and bring it with you or like look for a mirror use the reflect like harry take off your glasses and like look into the reflection of your glass like do something to actually like incorporate this new knowledge and protect yourselves because they're just back to like running around eyes wide open through the hallways and i'm like no boys i do feel like if the basket was around though harry would be able to sense it before it kind of like got close to them maybe it was quiet that day like we don't i just think it's like a little thing that they could have done and should have done and like maybe it's just another example of like something hermione did and would have done but they can make the connections but they don't necessarily know the right order to like go about enacting things I guess it goes against our style. They're like, we figure things out and then we go running like full steam ahead. Flying around by the seat of their pants. Yeah, they don't think they don't think things through. Like the fact that they decide to actually go to McGonagall first is pretty wild for them compared to the last book where they just kind of like they figured things out and you're like, you know what? 
Let's just deal with it ourselves. We're 11, but it's fine. No one knows anything more than an 11 year old knows anything. So when they arrive in the staff room, there's the announcement where all the teachers need to come to the staff room and all the students need to go to their dormitories and they want to stay because they want to get their information. But Harry gets them to hide in a cloak, a cloak closet so they can hear what, what the news is. But like, why don't they just stay out and wait for the professors to come and get the professors would be mad they're there, but they'll be like, wait, we like got this, like we have a lot of information to give you. It's really important. Like, I feel like the information is really important. So I feel like despite the fact they're breaking the rules, like, and maybe they, it would have taken a while for the professors to listen to them. And they aren't breaking the rules yet because they haven't heard the announcement yet. They just heard it. Like, they, they couldn't disapparate all the way to their common room. I agree. I think maybe a part of it is they're just curious cucumbers. They're like a thing we, we need to know. We just need to know. But then maybe also they thought, like, the announcement could pertain to what they would learned. Like, maybe someone else also had learned that and they just wanted to have as much information when they talked to McGonagall. Alternatively, they didn't know which teachers were coming in, so maybe they're like, oh, what if it's just Snape and Filch or something, you know? Like, you don't want to have to talk to them about this. I also absolutely, absolutely love how when Lockhart shows up all frazzled, no, what's going on? Severus Snape is the first one to be like, well, at least I can make this guy suffer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't you know everything about anything ever? And aren't you the bravest man alive? Why don't you deal with this? Good luck, Lockhart. And all the other teachers are like, yes, Lockhart, you're so smart. You said you knew how to do it. Go do the thing. Yes. Them all getting up on him is amazing. I've just, I'm, it's perfect. All of them have been waiting for this moment. And actually, my uncle says, like, after he leaves, when they just tell him to go fight the monster, he's like, she's like, okay, now that he's out of our way. Let's deal with the yeah, let's deal with the real issues at hand. I think this moment is neat because it's one of the only times we get a glimpse into how the general staff actually just interact with each other when there aren't students around. Like they might not all be best friends. Like Snape probably has a lot of different opinions than Minerva McGonagall, but like to a certain extent, they share in frustrations about certain coworkers. They share in, you know, they probably all bitch about Dumbledore all the time. You know, over cups of coffee in the break room or whatever. So it's kind of nice to just see how they all coexist as co-workers and as adults. Because you never really think about their relationships with each other that often during the series. It really only matters their individual relationships with, like, the Golden Trio. So it's nice to see that, like, I don't know. There's a bit of camaraderie there. So we do find out in the big plot, plot twist of, like, the chapter is that Ginny has been the one that's been taken by the monster. Which disturbs everything so harry and ron end up going back into the common room at some point and it just talks about how the common room is so quiet and the the mood is very like somber because everyone just assumes that jenny's dead at this point and harry the twins and ron are all grouped together they're not talking but they're all sitting together like grieving together but it, just, it describes that percy went to go mail his parents a letter to let them know and then he shut himself up in his room and just kind of shows like the disconnect between Percy and his family already because they're all sitting together and they're all kind of they're still together even though they're not talking but Percy him is, is always isolated he's always away and I do feel like it might be the older sibling kind of thing where he has the responsibility to let his parents know but also he feels responsible because you know he's the little sibling and he should be looking out for his younger siblings and he's the prefect. Yeah, and he's been distracted by his girlfriend all year and doesn't feel like he paid enough attention to Ginny. Which I get. I also understand that, like, he wants to probably put on a brave face for the younger siblings but can't in that moment. So he kind of wants to be alone. I mean, yeah, there's a lot going on. I think it makes sense that he, given the pressures he puts on himself as the older sibling there, wouldn't want to sh appear weak in front of them. And then also how he chooses to present himself. I don't think he'd want to be seen mourning publicly just by the other Gryffindors. Like, I feel like he he wants to be... I understand it. Like, he also had a very different relationship with all of his siblings. Like, I think if he were closer to, like, Charlie and Charlie were there or something, you know, he could maybe talk to him about it. But he doesn't have a great relationship with the twins. And... Ron's already getting in so much trouble like it seems like there's no one there that like understands the perspective he has on things so it would be harder for him to explain his feelings maybe yeah we already kind of see at this point where it's like when things get hard most of the Weasleys band together but Percy is always by himself which kind of leads into how he ends up leaving the family for later in the series because when things got hard like his family was all like we got to be together and because he felt differently he was by himself it also seems like it says a lot about who he is as a person who, like, 
is sort of practical and pragmatic. Like he, yes, going to send a letter for the parents is the smart and right thing to do. And that's why he does it. It sort of says like he, it's like he has less time to deal with emotions. Like he's like, he's feeling all these things, but he's like, being sad isn't doing something. Like he's very much, I need to be doing something. And I think I get that. I think a lot of Percy's issues are that like, because he values different things, his parents maybe even see him as a bit of cold early on just because he's not exactly as like warm and emotionally driven as some of the other Weasleys. And I think it almost leads to him being more isolated as opposed to like trying to find ways to connect with him on that level. They've never had to do that with any of their children before him and none of their children after him. So it's kind of easy to just sort of allow him to pull away and sort of not try and reach out to him on a level that appeals to him as an individual. They're like, the things that work for all our other kids aren't working for this one. Oh, well, you know? Yeah. That's what happens even with a lot of kids, too. It's like kind of like you don't really notice how Percy's cold because, you know, he's generally on paper doing very well. He's like a prefect. He gets good grades. He looks after his siblings, you know. He's very responsible. Like, you know he has so much anxiety. As a person who has so much anxiety, I'm like, Percy must have off-the-roots anxiety at all times. Like, he tries to stay out of trouble, because bad things are always happening at his school and he's just trying to keep it together and meanwhile his other siblings are running off intentionally seeking out the trouble and he's like you're seven or twelve and like this is a near-death experience and like you are not the one who should be handling it like sometimes he's the only practical one around like even in a room full of adult teachers and i think having to be that person definitely played a big role in him not being able to bond with his family well, moving away from Percy, Ron actually has the idea that um, they should go tell Lockhart what they found out because they assume at this point that Lockhart's going to go and rescue Jenny, or at least that's what the professor said he was going to do. And it's interesting that it came from Ron because I feel like Ron in this, we talked about it a little bit before, but Ron actually has a lot more insight and like he kind of helps Harry as they piece together what's going on. It's not just Harry kind of figuring things out and Ron going along with it. Like Ron, it's Ron's idea to go to Lockhart. It's Ron kind of tells Harry to speak personal tongue. Like Ron's a lot smarter. He's a lot smarter in a lot of ways. A, he he's really properly representing his role as the gap between Harry and magic as an option. Ron's like, you know magic language, use the magic language. Like, he's, he definitely, because even early on, it's still the first few books, I think even in the first three books, Harry's first reaction to things isn't like the magical solution. He's still not there. Harry's like, I don't know how to do the thing. And Ron's like, yeah, but you can magic it. And I feel like it's such an important role, on top of all the, like, sleuthing Ron also does in this chapter. I do wonder why they decided to go to Lockhart and not McGonagall at this point, because I feel like Ron especially does not believe in Lockhart he thinks he's an idiot he thinks he's like a fake a phony so at this point I I know that they're like they just they know that Lockhart is supposed to be going into the Chamber of Secrets to find Ginny but but in reality I don't don't know why they didn't question that and maybe go to a professor that they actually believe in I mean I guess it was sort of like a rush in my mind they're just sort of the same reason they didn't go and find themselves a mirror or anything is just like it's time sensitive Ginny is messaging and it's like the teachers just said Lockhart's doing the thing. We'll go get Lockhart since he's the one, you know? It just seemed in that moment like the right choice because the teachers had all sort of decided that Lockhart was... I mean, even though they were being notably facetious and clearly just wanted him out of the way, they flat out said it. I guess just in their minds, okay, Lockhart's doing the thing. We'll go talk to Lockhart. It's not the right choice, but it was like the easiest jump of who to go to next. Very true. And then they know Lockhart's in his office anyway, so I don't think McGonagall may have been around the school like trying to yeah trying to like organize the trains i mean also she's the head of house right she needs to go collect all the gryffindors so like she's doing other stuff well as they go to lockhart's office he is packing up his office and as it turns out ron is right and lockhart is a fake it turns out that he basically mollified people's memories and took their like accomplishments as his and then he tried to modify Harry and Ron's memories. And I'm just thinking that he did this in his school where all the teachers were. And I'm like, if he had gotten caught, like, that's like, a, I feel like a huge crime not to just modify someone's memory, but also to do it to children that are technically under your care. I feel like it's interesting because we learn about the unforgivable curses. Like those three are like automatic Azkaban. But there are other spells that have to be crimes to use. Other dark magic spells for sure. And then also... 
like even if they have good uses, that was a bad use of that spell. It kind of seems like we don't get a lot of like understanding of other spells and like illegality and like proper usage. It's just not something we get from the book. But to me, like using that on anyone that isn't like for like a medical purpose. I also think like not with their consent because I feel like I could see like med- memory charms being good for like people that have experienced trauma and stuff to help ease the pain but I feel like you it's something you have to consent to yeah for their yeah exactly and like children even if they wanted that you, your child it's another example like they need to be aware of what's happening so it's a t- 100% a crime and like if he didn't have if, if Lockhart doesn't end up the way he ends up later in this chapter I think he would absolutely be going to Azkaban for a whole bunch of reasons. But I guess when he completely loses his mind and is kind of has no memory of having done it and he's not really a harm to anyone, it makes sense that he would just stay at a hospital. My question then sort of becomes like, now that we know what he's done and we're not going to hold him like responsible by putting him away, there has to be some sort of like culpability nonetheless. Like you got to think because he had loads of money from being famous, they have to like use his accounts to pay reparations to his victims or something, right? Like to me- Yeah, I'm assuming if it's like a fraud case and they probably have so much evidence to get against him. But- yeah, like, I'm sure a lot of the people have passed away or don't remember, but like the money should go to them even if they don't remember doing it. Like all the money from the book about fighting the werewolf should go to the guy who fought the werewolf or his family. You know what I mean? Like there has to be reparations because it's awful and you ruin people's lives. Yeah, I could definitely see that. He's not only a dick, but he's a horrible person. So here he uses his signature spell, uh, Expelliarmus, to get Lockhart's wand before he can um, walk by the memories and Ron throws it out a window. <laughs> Harry even stops to be grateful. He's like, I'm glad Snape taught me that. And it's so funny because like, Everyone always says, like, Snape would have been a terrible blah, blah, blah. And Snape, and I'm like, yes, yes, he's, I'm not saying he's nice, but I am saying he taught Harry a very helpful spell at a good point in his life, and it became very helpful to Harry. And I feel like he could have just been a good Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher if it weren't for the rest of his life. (laughs) In a vacuum, Snape could have been great. Debatable. But, uh, they head into the wash into the bathroom where Moni Myrtle is waiting, and uh, they ask her how she died, which she is surprisingly really interested in. I mean, I guess that's like I, most people just avoid her, so probably someone asking her something at all is, is unique. I also just think she's a very morbid person. Like you know, the people in real life, they like Debbie Downer. It's like you wouldn't say something bad happened to you, and they try to one up you because just like they they feed off just of misery. And like they just they just have to be the most miserable person. Like no matter what happened to you, their misery is worse. I just feel like she was that kind of person, and we, when she was alive, and so she loves talking about all the bad things that have happened to her. I mean, I think it's a little bit she's stuck in the state she was when she died, which was very emotionally upset. So like she's a little bit a caricature of those emotions, which is really shitty because that's a rough state to die in. But also, I think no one likes to talk to her. So the fact that someone like sought her out and is asking her a question in itself is like a novelty, but also it's not like, Hey, can you do me a favor? Hey, do you know the answer to this homework question? It's literally tell me about this thing about you. Like it probably feels good to have someone show interest in her. Cause I feel like the ghosts are often not treated like people that live in the school or like exist, I guess in the school, they don't live in the school. Um, they're dead. But um, yeah. I think like <laughs> people, that the characters in the book that are alive humans often forget sort of the humanity of the ghosts. And I feel like this particular question appealed to her because she's like, they're not being like, haha, a ghost. They're asking me about having been alive or about my life. So yeah, it's it's something personal about her too. And we know that she was like severely bullied when she was at school. So I feel like just someone asking something that happened to her and she can just kind of vent about this thing that happened to her. It's like, it's very important. Yeah. She's been through it. I feel bad for her. She's heckin' annoying, but I feel really bad for her. Well, this is where we find out that that the toilet, or, or was it the sink? The sink is basically the entrance to the chamber of secrets. The toilet is the entrance to the Ministry of Magic. Yeah. And the sink is the entrance to the chamber of secrets. What is with all this bathroom, washroom stuff? In Wizard the plumbers are just big fans of secrets. <laughs> I don't know. Isn't it kind of weird that Salazar Slytherin had an entrance to the Chamber of Secrets in a girl's washroom? Maybe it wasn't always a girl's washroom. Like, maybe it was a boy's washroom at some point. Or, like, you know, Salazar Slytherin was just, like, maybe the girl's bathroom was just cleaner than the boy's bathroom. You know? Kind of a red flag. Or, 
I mean, like, it makes sense when you think about, like, pipes and stuff. Like, there are a lot of pipes and stuff in bathrooms and, I guess, kitchens. And we know the kitchen is downstairs, so there's not going to be as much pipe for the snake to get through. It's also kind of noticeable because the house house elves are down there. And, like, people would notice if, like, the house elves were dying and they weren't getting fed. Exactly. So I think that sort of makes sense. I'm just assuming he was, like... I'll use a bathroom because the students can't be there at a certain hour if it's not the one like in their common room and I'll use a girl's bathroom because it's cleaner <laughs> but either way uh, Ron is the one that gives Harry the idea to say something in parcel tongue which Harry does to cause it to open and it, it's kind of cool that it's Ron's idea because when it, when it comes back to Deathly Hollows, Ron is the one that mimics Harry speaking parcel tongue to open the chamber of secrets when he's with Hermione yeah it's pretty cool that he remembers I mean, I guess he says, I mean, later on, it's he hears Harry speak partial tongue again later on because Harry talks in his sleep. <laughs> but um, I think it is a fun, like, full circle moment that Ron returns there and this time he says the partial tongue. I think that's nice. But also just another example of how important and integral Ron is. But in regards to things that are funny, imagining Harry trying to speak a language he doesn't consciously speak, just like in a bathroom, eyes real close to the faucet, like, open not sure if he's speaking english not sure if he's saying like so open <laughs> like and runs just there like nope english nope english and then he's like oh open, wait please oh wait that was it that was parcel tongue <laughs> so instead of letting lockhart leave they uh push him down first as their hostage ron just freaking yeets him <laughs> into the tunnel of doom like could have killed the man i wouldn't have been mad about it i would have been totally fine with it but. i just love the idea of this like fully adult professor probably in this like mid-30s being terrorized by two 12 year olds yep i think at this point like a ron's like my sister's down there i give a shit about a grand total of zero things and also like at this point they've seen he's a coward and a liar and they've seen the other teachers overheard the other teachers all knowing he's a coward and a liar and disrespecting him. So I think at this point, Ron has no respect for Lockhart. He knows the people he respects don't have respect for Lockhart. So he's like, this guy is just something that's either going to help me or hinder me in finding my sister. And I'm not here to care on where he stands. I'm going to make him out. Yeah, it kind of shows like how deeply like Ron cares about his family. Like in the books we see, like he really cares about and respects his family. And so when things are kind of like happening to his family or set up his family, he reacts quite explosively. Yeah. As the Weasley way. Yeah. After they learn the basics of the Basilisk and that Ginny's been taken, I know they're kind of stuck on like, okay, we have to solve it. But it seems like the kind of information they still had time to share with other people. Like when they're sitting in the common room and Fred and George are there, they could be like, it's a snake. If you look in its eyes, you'll die. Please use mirrors. Like just little things that like, again, are just they don't think about because they have so much going on. But I think Hermione would have thought of and would have been a good idea. Yeah, Hermione would probably win the one to like push them to tell people and to probably other than going to Lockhart, maybe going to like McGonagall or another professor just so more professors are aware. Yeah. Listen, also, we're going down into the thing. If we don't come back, we're dead. It's a snake. Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? I don't know. And even, like, that's, like, at the bare minimum to me. Because also, like, they don't know a lot of spells and they have one working wand. I guess there's a part of me that thinks, like, they probably could have just invited the twins. Been like, we think we know where it is. You guys know way more spells than us. Like, I don't know why. I guess it's just not, like, the book wants it to be more Harry and Ron time, wants their friendship to grow. But I feel like from a logical perspective of, like, if you're, like, have whatever the two hours sitting in the common room with the twins before you can go and do the stuff, you might as well be, like, seeing how you can benefit yourself. And I feel like I would have been like, hey, you two, this is what we know. This is what we're going to do. I think it did happen in the way that they didn't really expect to be going into the chamber. Uh, I think they waited till everyone went to bed and they're like, Ron just wanted something to do. So he's like, let's just tell Lockhart what we know so that if he does end up going into the chamber, he's prepared. And then it just kind of turned out that Lockhart was a a fraud and they just kind of like went along with how things rolled and how they kind of panned out, which is very Gryffindor of them. I don't know. I'm just like, if I were the twins, I'd be pissed. I'd be like, we could have, you know, held a door open or like punched Lockhart a few times. Like they could have done something. At bare minimum, having some wands that work wouldn't have, wouldn't hinder the group. Lockhart turns out to be a liability because while they're down there, he pretends to faint and takes Ron's wand, which I don't understand why. 
you taught him for like these eight months and you don't know that the wand's a liability. I do not think Lockhart pays enough attention to anything besides himself to have noticed that. <laughs> he doesn't see things that are not in the mirror. <laughs> Lockhart tries to uh, blast away Ron's memory, which backfires and causes a cave-in in the tunnel they're in, which separates Harry and Ron. Yeah. We kind of end the chapter off with this kind of like unspoken moment between Harry and Ron where Harry says that Ron should just try and move some of the rocks and Harry will go on and find Jenny. It's exactly like in the first book, the moment where they decide, Harry, you have to go on. It has to be you. It's sort of that exact moment again, you know? Yeah, Harry and Ron just don't really need to say anything. Like, Harry is like, if I don't come out in an hour, and then Ron's just like, they, they try to say something, but there's nothing that you can really say in that moment. But they just, they both know, like, how much they care for each other and how much they, like, yeah, how much they're in, in over their heads. And it's just very much like, if I'm not back in an hour, I'm dead. Also, your sister's dead. Bye. <laughs> like, there's just, yeah, it, it's very reminiscent of, like, Deathly Hollows, where uh, Harry has to go on and, like... I think it's more in the movie. They kind of had this moment where like Hermione obviously hugs Harry, but Ron and Harry just have a look because they just, they just know. And like, I always, I always say that Harry and Ron's friendship is really overlooked, especially in the movies compared to Harry and Hermione. Yeah. Etc. And yeah, it's just nice to see these, like, these like really subtle Harry and Ron moments that are so important. Right, Nimbus? <laughs> and we end the chapter with Harry going into the Chamber of Secrets to find Jenny. Very ominous. We don't really know what's going to happen. Yeah, so you have any uh, final kind of thoughts before we sign off? A little bit. I think that the idea of there being other spells that should have like legal legality or like usages, whether legal or not, is an interesting idea. And I think going forward, when we encounter new spells that we think are particularly risky or have a lot of potential harmful effects, I think it would be interesting to look at them and see sort of like what uses they should be allowed in and sort of how they should be regulated. Because I feel like, especially with Obliviate, medical uses, therapeutic uses, consensual, matching those sort of guidelines makes sense. But I would love to have an idea of like, what is the Azkaban sentence if you do that to someone? You know, like it seems like a one of those spells that just gets overlooked because it's easy to forget. It's also like a spell, that, like, because, like, the unforgivables can't really be, they're illegal because they're basically all bad. They don't have any good uses. They're, like, evil spells. But a lot of the spells that we see, like, they have, there's good uses and bad uses. Like, there's, there's, like, there's always, like, a bad side to it, but, like, there's also good. So, like, Obliviate could help someone in therapy, but it's also bad. It would be interesting to know where you would learn a spell like that. You know, like, I mean, you could just learn it from a book and everyone can find books, but it'd be interesting to know if that's a spell you learn in like, maybe let's say aura training or like after you graduate from Hogwarts in a particular line of work where it's deemed relevant, or if that's something you can actually just like learn in school because it seems dangerous. I'd like to know, like, cause we don't know a lot about like where people learn things when they're done at Hogwarts, just out in the world. Do they all just read a lot? I don't know. It'd be interesting to see that as well. We know that Hermione knows it in book seven, but it could be that they learn it in book seven or she just happens to know yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, they didn't really go to class in book seven, so they would have had to learn it in like book six. I think in my mind, like she heard about it from them having talked about what Lockhart did. She thought it was interesting. She looked it up out of curiosity and was like, hopefully I'll never have to use that. And then did have to use that. Joke's on you. Yeah, thanks for listening to this episode. If you have any thoughts or anything we discussed, you can email us at podrevisitedpodcast at gmail.com or you can reach out on social media at podrevisited and we'll see you next time as we cover chapter 17, The Heir of Slytherin. Bye! Bye.